Good early evening, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you for joining us for our panel to discuss the various views on U.S.-China relations, the outlook for Taiwan, is Taiwan like Ukraine? What about the bipolar ideological conflict that seems to be developing uh, with China and the outside world? Um, we have uh, done some planning for this session in order to try to make it more interesting for all of you and for ourselves. We're gonna kind of change the format a little bit from the normal presentation and sequence of different points of view on the same subject, but try to develop some interchange. Uh, I come from the United States where we've been protected by two oceans, and so the rest of the world always looks very similar. We, we, we take a position on terrorism or communism or uh, some other issue when we expect the rest of the world to take the same position because they're all the same out there. And I, what I hope today's panel does is show how different the perspectives are from different national points of view. And we're going to ask each of our participants on the panel to, to, to speak on, these, on their particular viewpoints. Um, there's a, a quality, I mean, we're, we're assuming that there's a U.S. position and that it's pretty uh, strong in opposition to China going into this discussion. I'll point out that this afternoon, the czar of American Indo-Pacific policy in Washington, Kurt Campbell, made a presentation in which he said, in fact, we're returning. He didn't use the word to engagement because he's the author of the obituary of engagement with China. But he said, we're returning to normal interstate relations as a result of China co effectively capitulating to American policy uh, over the next year. We can talk about that and, and many other subjects in the course. But today we have a, um, a very distinguished panel that represents a fairly broad range. Unfortunately, it's a mantle, not a panel with men and women representatives. We all apologize in our own way for not being able to reflect the gender differences that we should be on this, uh, uh, on this stage. Uh, you have the biographies of our, of our presenters. We've got uh, John Andrews, who is a senior journalist for The Economist, Jean-Pierre Cabastin, who is a longtime China scholar and is at the um, uh, at an Institute for Research in Hong Kong. Uh, Renaud Girard is from the Figaro uh, in Paris. Uh, Mr. Hosoya, professor from Keio University and uh, doing a lot of international policy research. Uh, Him Min, Min, Min Li, who is a uh, longtime trade professional for the Korean government uh, and is now working for Kim and Chang, a very distinguished law firm. And we've got Mr. Samir Saran from uh, India, from Delhi, from the uh, uh, Observers Research Forum. And then via the virtual connection, we have Professor Wang Ji Si from uh, Peking University. Uh, we're glad to welcome him here. I'm greatly disappointed we can't have you here in person, Ji Si, but we're so happy you could at least participate this way. Now, um, to get us started, I'm going to ask panelists to respond to a question about just how far do you think, does your government at home think the U.S. will succeed in evoking or forcing uh, your government, the government you watch closely from your perch, to follow the U.S. in its policy of pursuing a bipolar world where we uh, divide between those who are uh, in favor of China's disruption of the liberal international order or support the American position of protecting and developing the international order. So why don't we start? Yeah. Uh, well, there's absolutely no doubt that um, the UK will do whatever the US wants. Uh, <laughs> if, you, if you go back to the days of, we've had lots of prime ministers recently, but if you go back to the days of David Cameron, the idea then was uh, a golden era of relations with, yeah. between the UK and China. Well, that golden era is now long gone. Um, Britain caved in to American pressure over Huawei. Um, when I say caved in, I mean, that's a pejorative phrase. Um, and I think in the end, uh, probably the security people in the UK were happy uh, to have their arms twisted. Mm -hmm. But I mean, basically, the UK was, is always going to follow the US lead. 
And I think that is also true, essentially, of all the countries in NATO. I mean, the thing, if you look at, the, the, at China, the People's Republic, and the USA, I mean, the fact is that um, you know, the US has lots of allies, but, the, but China has lots of trade partners. I was shocked the other day when Carl Bildt pointed out that, um, that there are only 20 countries in the UN who name the US as their number one trading partner. So essentially that means you know, Canada, Mexico, a few Caribbean islands and so on. Whereas um, if you take the, the reverse, you take you know, who na how many countries name China as a lead uh, trading partner, it's at least 120. So if you were to look at this sort of rivalry as a potential conflict, then you're tempted to use the phrase, you know, might is right. Well, how do you, how do you define might? Is it economic uh, pressure, economic links, or is it military pressure, military links? I mean, that may be something that we can get uh, involved in later. But I think that the, what lies behind your question, Douglas, is um, what, if, it come, if push comes to shove, which way will countries, what choice will countries make? Well, of course, none of the countries want to have that choice. They want to avoid it. And I think common sense should indicate that the choice never has to be made. But that's what we're saying now with you know, the benefit of common sense. You know, common sense doesn't always work. You look at, you know, you have First World War, Second World War, and so on. Um, I think that if you look around the world at the moment, if you take NATO out and say, okay, all the NATO members will follow an American lead. If you look at Africa, I mean, there are now something like 10,000 uh, Chinese firms operating in Africa. You've got the Chinese military base in Djibouti. You've got um, potential bases also. And I think China now is developing something like 50 different ports in Africa. That's not necessarily a bad thing. If you take the whole BRI initiative, which is obviously not just Africa, it's, it's Europe, it's Central Asia, and so on, um, that really does bring real influence to bear. The downside of that, of course, is that you get a sort of debt imperialism. If you take um, Sri Lanka, for example, um, there uh, the Rajapaksa government went into some dodgy deal and has suffered for it, uh, but it means that the main port is now basically taken over by China. If you take uh, Greece, where I was in Athens last week, I mean, Piraeus, one of the best ports in Europe, is now Chinese-owned, effectively, and works very, very efficiently, very effectively. So one shouldn't um, see this in a Manichaean way. I mean, there are reasons why, people sh why countries should accept largesse from China, but the largesse also does come with some strings attached. I thought it's interesting that you know, Xi Jinping is maybe even now still in Saudi Arabia. I mean, they may be leaving tonight, I'm not sure when. Perhaps he's waiting for the soccer matches to finish in Qatar. But, um, I mean, Xi Jinping is making good friends with Saudi Arabia and really with the whole Gulf Cooperation Council countries. Remember that Saudi Arabia has been a faithful American ally really since the foundation, 1932. So we're talking 90 years. Now that's all up for grabs. Um, I don't want to wrap it on too much, but I would think that you know, Africa really does not want to make this choice, and I don't think it really has to. Um, it, can be, it's, it can be independent. A much more difficult choice, I think, is in Southeast Asia and South Asia. I mean, Pakistan is, I think, really in hock to China, thanks to the CPC, the China-Pakistan Economic Corridor. And if you take the countries of Southeast Asia, they all depend on China uh, for their, their trading links, their economic growth. The challenge will be over Taiwan and what may happen there. Uh, I'm actually fairly optimistic. I, think, um, I don't think Xi Jinping is a madman, um, nor, incidentally, do I think um, Vladimir Putin is a madman. But you can't really... Um, militate too much against what can happen when people make decisions which then lead to other consequences. Uh, I think we, I'm talking, when I say we, I sort of mean the West here. 
I think we were lulled into complacency in the era of Deng Xiaoping, and that carried on with Jiang Zemin and with Hu Jintao. Um, I think with, with Xi, it's a different ball game, and we don't really know how to assess him, how to treat him. And I think that means that the possibility of miscalculation does exist. A final thought, if there were um, a war, remember that American military really is battle-hardened. Um, so if there were a war between China and the States, regardless of who is on what side, I suspect uh, America would win. But that's sort of a catastrophic uh, concept, which I don't think is going to happen. Uh, but you know, one lesson I think that she has taken from the Ukraine war is that the American military and NATO in general, but especially the American military, is really very, very good. And I suspect that if you look at the Chinese military, even though it has invested enormous amount into, into modernizing the military, the Navy is supposedly now bigger than America's Navy, nonetheless, it hasn't done, it doesn't have much battle experience. And what it's had has been pretty poor, for example, uh, in Vietnam. So let me leave it there. Well, thank you, John. I think I, there are a number of things I'd like to probe on that. Are, is China going to be everybody's leading trade partner forever? Um, is, is the uh, disposition of forces the way it, you've described it, or has it been changing? Is the debt policy of China uh, undergoing uh, various changes, as we heard this morning in other panels? <coughs> I'd like to come back to some of that. But now, Jean-Pierre. Well, uh, thank you. Uh, as a Frenchman based in Asia for many years, my view may be a bit uh, biased because I'm more sensitive to the uh, rise of China, to its uh, growing assertiveness in the region, than if I were based in Paris or, uh, or in, uh, elsewhere in Europe, where, of course, the Ukraine war, the Middle East and Africa are much more, um, much more pressing issues than what's going on in the Far East, what we used to call the Far East in Europe, which is uh, the Indo-Pacific region. Um, I have to say, I mean, th the short answer to your question, uh, Doug, is that um, I think the U.S. has been and will remain more successful uh, in the global north and in the global south in uh, aligning um, its uh, allies and partners uh, with it on China and uh, the growing tension in, the, uh, uh, in East Asia. Um, uh, John mentioned, and I basically agree with him, that uh, NATO is a big factor of, uh, of uh, you know, uh, bringing together the Europeans and the, and the Amer no, Americans and the Canadians um, on an on, on issue like China. I mean, the fact that China now is one of the issues uh, discussed in NATO is an important uh, move in the direction of a more, coordinate, more transatlantic coordination on East Asia and China. So that's the thing which uh, I think we can't, we can't ignore. Uh, another trend which has taken place even before this uh, recent tension in the Taiwan Strait for some years is the fact that the European Union itself has moved away from a full kind of naive engagement with <coughs> China to a much more balanced uh, China policy. You know, we, we, we know the three pillars of this policy now. One is co economic cooperation, the other one is economic competition, and the third one, uh, which is something which has shocked the Chinese uh, when it appeared in 2019, was the idea of uh, we are in a systemic rivalry with China. So China is a systemic rival, whatever it means. It means that we don't share the same political values, that we don't see the international order the same way, uh, we don't abide to by, by international law the same, uh, in the same manner, in particular, the, for, for instance, as far as the, the law of the sea is concerned and many other aspects of international law. So uh, I think here, uh, in other words, China's growing power has brought together more than before uh, the Europeans and the Americans on, on, on China. Now, it doesn't mean there are no differences. There are quite a number of frictions, which we mentioned earlier today, uh, like uh, you know the, 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 the trade war and the uh, and how, how much uh, sh shall we shall we put sanctions on China? Not only for uh, human rights in infringements, like the question of Xinjiang, which uh, on, on the Xinjiang issue, I mean uh, that was two years ago for the first time. 
the Europeans the, with the Americans, the U British and the Canadians decided to impose sanctions on some officials in Xinjiang. And that's what, um, from the European point of view and the European Union point of view, that was unprecedented. So those are changes which are, tend to bridge the gap between the, uh, the Europeans and, and, and the Americans on, Southeast Asia, uh, on, on, on China. Now, if we look at East Asia, I think you, you mentioned Southeast Asia, which is, uh, yes, of course, in a very difficult position. Uh, but just a word about Southeast Asia is that, uh, of course, they, they can't... Um, publicly and openly criticize China, but they're very happy to have the U.S. around yeah. and to, to keep the U.S. around uh, all the way from the Vietnamese, of course, uh, which have been in, uh, in, you know, in a difficult version for 1,000 years with the Chinese, but also with countries like Singapore, which uh, are very happy to have the Americans <coughs> in Tongi and, and uh, in the Malacca Strait as well. So, uh, but and, and in addition to those countries, of course, you have countries in East Asia like Japan, and, and, and we're going to talk about in, in, in South Korea, which are also uh, U.S. allies. And these uh, U.S. alliances in the uh, Indo-Pacific region have uh, remained a, a factor of uh, alignment with the U.S. <coughs> position in uh, uh, regarding China. Uh, now, of course, the, the burning issue, I mean, we, we may come back to that later, but it's a Taiwan issue. And I have to say what has triggered the growing tensions in, in the Taiwan Strait has been um, uh, the, uh, not only China's uh, clear assertiveness, but also is, is more obvious haste to unify mm. China, Taiwan with China. And that has been, to me, a major destabilizing factor in the region because most of the country in the region are attached to the status quo in the Taiwan Strait. And for the first time since, well, I mean, it started actually 10 years ago, more or less, more or less in 2013, when, when, when Xi Jinping decided that we can't leave this, generation, this question unsolved and, and transmit it from one generation to another. So now we uh, clearly, uh, uh, the, uh, China's policy towards Taiwan has, we, has been to mix more, uh, much more carrot and stick and to use much more coercion against Taiwan in order to try to convince Taiwan to, to unify with China. But the, the problem with the, this policy has badly backfired and actually uh, rally a number of countries which were not that close to uh, the U.S. To, to, the, to, to the U.S. and to uh, support of uh, the status quo in, in the Taiwan Strait. So that, now, we may come back later to the comparison between <coughs> Ukraine and, 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 and Taiwan. I would just say a word about the Global South, because uh, I've, you know, the last 10 years I've worked quite a lot on China-Africa relations. I've done a quite a number of field works in Africa. And clearly the Africans don't want to choo choose between the U.S. and China. But one thing I will remind everyone, I mean, for the one coming from Africa, they're very familiar with, with Afrobarometer, is that both China and the U.S. are pretty popular in Africa in terms of, uh, 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 you know, favorable views. Uh, they are more or less at the same level. 60% of the Africans are favorable of China, but there's also 58% of the Africans that have favorable, favorable view of the U.S., much more than the, uh, uh, the, the, of, uh, the, the, their view of, the, you know, much more positive view than their view of the former colonial powers. So, so uh, and they clearly they don't want to choose. They see, uh, even today, I think most uh, countries in the South, they, they think they can get away with these uh, new so-called Cold War between the U.S. and China, and remain neutral, and still benefit from cooperating with both sides. The problem with the, you know, talk about Africa is the, f the fact that the U.S. is much less present in Africa, and that the, uh, the American uh, diplomacy has deserted Africa, and that's been, uh, I think, a big, a big, a, very, uh, a big weak point of the of the of the Americans in in that continent, and, and that's l uh, opened the way, opened a boulevard actually to China, uh, to becoming much more uh, active <laughs> from a diplomatic point of view, military point of view, but also uh, with the BRI, the Belt and Road Initiative, economic point of view. So that's where we are now. Well, thank you very much, Jean-Pierre. As a parent of diplomats who are uh, self-professed Africanists, I recognize your last remark very clearly. Breno, can you, last week, uh, President Macron declared himself uh, having conducted a highly successful state visit to Washington. Uh, can you comment on the French view of this? Um, um, merci, uh, Dag. Effectivement, j'ai voulu uh, m'exprimer sur uh, prendre cet aspect de la rivalité uh, sino-américaine, de prendre uniquement l'angle de la France. Et uh, quand j'ai regardé cette question, je me suis dit qu'en fait, il y avait un problème français de cul entre deux chaises. Et alors, je vais essayer de vous expliquer en quelques minutes uh, pourquoi la France 
a le cul entre deux chaises dans cette affaire. Et, euh, euh, et euh, pourquoi et comment euh, euh, et quelles sont les conséquences de cette politique de cul entre deux chaises euh, Alors, il est évident que la France ne veut pas être, elle en a conscience, victime collatérale de cette rivalité entre la Chine et l'Amérique pour devenir la euh, première puissance mondiale. Elle ne veut pas être la victime collatérale d'un quelconque piège de Thucydide. Ça, c'est certain. Ouais. Par ailleurs, la France comprend qu'elle, en elle-même, dans le grand jeu mondial, elle ne pèse plus suffisamment, ni par sa démographie, ni économiquement, ni par son commerce extérieur, euh, ni par euh, euh, même sa force militaire, elle ne peut pas peser par son propre poids et influencer le grand jeu mondial euh, parce que euh, ce n'est plus effectivement une grande puissance. En revanche, elle comprend que par sa tradition, elle a été elle-même la première puissance du monde jusqu'à Waterloo, euh, elle comprend euh, qu'elle peut être entendue. Et ça, je crois que euh, le président français Emmanuel Macron euh, veut se faire entendre. Il veut, en fait, jouer un rôle d'intermédiaire, de « honest broker », on dit ça en, en, en anglais, euh, dans tous les conflits du monde. Et il a essayé, d'ailleurs. Euh, et on peut lui rendre grâce d'avoir essayé. Il a essayé notamment sur l'Iran, à Biarritz. Ce n'est pas de sa faute si ça n'a pas marché. Trump était prêt à rencontrer euh, à New York le président Rouhani et c'est euh, le guide suprême Khamenei qui n'a pas voulu. Donc, il a essayé. Il a essayé sur la Libye, il a essayé sur le Liban, il a essayé sur beaucoup de coups coup de crise, il a essayé sur l'Ukraine, évidemment. Il a été voir euh, Poutine euh, dix jours avant euh, l'invasion ou quinze jours avant l'invasion. Ça n'a pas marché, mais euh, ce n'est pas parce que ça n'a pas marché qu'il faut le blâmer. Il a évidemment raison de faire euh, tous les efforts qu'il faut pour, euh, pour la paix. Alors maintenant, effectivement, il aimerait sans doute être euh, l'honnête broker entre euh, la Chine et les Américains. Mais je pense que s'il ne change pas de politique, il ne va pas y arriver. Je vais essayer de, de vous expliquer pourquoi. Euh, D'abord, euh, il a vu euh, Xi Jinping à Bali. C'était le 15 novembre dernier. Il y a eu un, un entretien entre les deux délégations chinoises euh, et françaises. Alors, c'est vrai qu'il n'était pas très à l'aise, euh, le président Macron, quant à sa politique chinoise, parce que elle venait de s'effondrer, c'est-à-dire la politique récente venait de s'effondrer. La politique récente de la France à l'égard de la Chine, c'était « je fais tout avec l'Allemagne ». Donc quand Xi Jinping était venu en mars 2019 en visite d'État en France, il avait eu la surprise de voir dans le bureau de Macron euh, le président de la Commission, qui était, je crois, Juncker à l'époque, et euh, la chancelière d'Allemagne, euh, Merkel, parce que comme ça, on va être entendu, on est plus fort quand on est dans l'ensemble face euh, face à la Chine. Et quand lui-même est allé faire un, une visite en Chine, Macron, en novembre 2019, il a fait une conférence avec les industriels français pour défendre, évidemment, les intérêts de la France. C'est un peu son boulot. Mais il a aussi invité les industriels allemands. Donc, euh, il était comme le défenseur de l'industrie allemande. Et là, euh, le, le Scholz, qui n'a pas euh, la reconnaissance du ventre allemand, quand Macron lui demande, et c'est un camouflet, parce que Macron lui a demandé publiquement, lui demande d'aller avec lui euh, en, euh, en, en Chine, il dit « Ah non, 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 j'y vais tout seul ». Et évidemment, il était hors de question pour le chancelier Scholz d'aller même imaginer défendre les intérêts industriels français lors de, son, de sa visite, euh, de sa visite euh, en Chine. Donc, donc, il n'est pas, lorsqu'il voit euh, Xi Jinping le 15 novembre en tête à tête, euh, effectivement, il n'est pas très à l'aise, Emmanuel Macron. Mais la conversation commence. Et que lui demande Xi Jinping Que dit Xi Jinping à Macron Il dit deux choses. Il parle, les deux mots importants dans l'allocution de Xi Jinping, qu'on peut voir d'ailleurs sur YouTube, c'est « indépendance » et « ouverture ». Alors ça, c'est une leçon à la France. C'est l'indépendance. Bon, vous, la France, vous êtes le premier européen 
avoir reconnu la chaîne populaire, c'était la politique d'indépendance du général de Gaulle. Euh, on en est où de votre indépendance Et l'ouverture, ça veut dire quoi Ça veut dire ne faites pas comme les Américains. Ne vous fermez pas au commerce avec nous. Ne vous fermez pas aux échanges technologiques avec nous, comme le font euh, les euh, Américains. Et là, euh, Macron, en fait, ne répond pas. Il ne répond pas à Xi Jinping. Et euh, pourquoi il ne répond pas sur ces questions euh, à Xi Jinping Parce qu'en en fait, il n'a pas vraiment choisi. Euh, Est-ce que je suis, moi, français, la France, aligné sur l'Amérique Et on peut être très bien être aligné. Le Japon et la Corée sont tout à fait alignés sur la politique américaine et peuvent très bien faire parfaitement du commerce avec la Chine Ou est-ce que je suis totalement indépendant Il n'a pas choisi. On peut choisir. Hein on peut choisir. Euh, euh, et on n'est pas forcément puni. Euh, sur le Vietnam, par exemple, par rapport à l'Amérique, De Gaulle a choisi. Il a été avec l'Amérique sur la, la, la crise de Cuba. Mais sur le Vietnam, il n'a il a, il a pas été neutre. Il n'a pas été comme les, ang les Anglais euh, de travaillistes à l'époque, étaient extrêmement... Euh, disaient rien sur le Vietnam. Lui, il a critiqué. Euh, euh, C'est le discours de Phnom Penh. Euh, mais finalement, euh, ça a marché, puisqu'on a décidé euh, d'ouvrir de, euh, des négociations de paix à Paris. Elles se sont faites à Paris, puisque Nixon a fait sa première visite pour De Gaulle en 1969. Euh, c'est la première visite de Nixon qui vient d'être élu président. C'est pour De Gaulle. Et c'est là, d'ailleurs, que De Gaulle lui conseille de euh, reconnaître la Chine populaire et ce que va faire un peu plus tard euh, Nixon. Donc, c'est une politique qui peut réussir, même si, vous, si elle est tranchée. Euh, et la France n'a pas été punie par les États-Unis pour euh, cette, politique, euh, cette politique indépendante. Là, euh, en fait, on sent euh, que Macron n'a pas tout à fait choisi. Alors, au lieu de répondre à Xi Jinping dans ce euh, dialogue de Bali qui va dire durer euh, 40 minutes seulement. Hein. Il lui dit, il faut, et c'est une bonne idée, il faut que vous nous aidiez sur l'Ukraine. Et effectivement, la Chine a beaucoup plus de poids sur la Russie que la France. Et donc, c'est une bonne idée d'essayer de prendre la Chine avec, euh, avec soi pour essayer d'influencer euh, la Russie. Mais le problème, c'est que Macron, il demande un service. Donc, à la Chine, il demande quelque chose. La veille, euh, Biden a vu, euh, euh, a vu euh, Xi Jinping. Mais Biden, il n'a rien demandé. À, il n'a rien demandé à, à, à Xi Jinping. Il lui a dit simplement, bon, tous les deux, là, on va fixer les lignes rouges. C'est la diplomatie des lignes rouges. Très bien. Macron, il demande quelque chose. Mais tu demandes quelque chose, mais qu'est-ce que tu donnes en échange C'est la base de la diplomatie. Tu demandes un truc, mais tu donnes quoi en échange Et ça, Macron n'y a pas pensé parce qu'il a le cul entre deux chaises, parce qu'il n'a pas décidé. Il aurait pu dire, bon, OK, euh, si tu me donnes euh, ton appui sur l'Ukraine pour vraiment faire en sorte que euh, Poutine se retire euh, des territoires qu'il a conquis, moi, je vais aller voir euh, Biden... Euh, en visite d'État, d'ailleurs, c'était déjà prévu en Amérique, et je lui dirais, euh, ben, on va faire peut-être une discussion, même à trois, euh, qu'est-ce que tu veux euh, Qu'est-ce que tu veux des Américains, exactement Bon, les Américains euh, ne t'exporteront te, pas de, 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 de puces électroniques, ne t'aideront pas dans, ta, dans tes technologies, mais peut-être qu'on peut obtenir une vraie discussion. Et moi, Français je vais être l'honnête broker de cette décision. Tu m'aides sur l'Ukraine et moi, je t'aide face aux États-Unis. Eh bien, non, il ne l'a pas fait. Et euh, j'ai écouté la conférence de presse de Macron et de Biden. Il n'y a pas la moindre allusion sur la Chine. Hier, le mot n'est même pas prononcé, le mot Chine. Et il y a aussi une émission qu'a faite Macron à la télévision française de 20 minutes où il résume, en fait, pour la, euh, la télévision, pour TF1, son voyage. Il n'en parle pas du tout. Et donc, euh, tant qu'il n'aura pas tranché, tant qu'il n'aura pas une position euh, claire, je pense qu'il n'arrivera pas à faire ce qu'il veut faire, c'est-à-dire à être l'honnête broker entre euh, la Chine et les États-Unis et de ne pas être euh, une victime collatérale. Et c'est un défaut, si vous voulez, <coughs> 
qui n'est pas nouveau dans la diplomatie française. Nous avons eu ce même défaut euh, lors de, du sommet de l'OTAN en, euh, euh, en avril 2008, euh, où euh, nous avons mis notre veto à l'entrée de l'Ukraine dans l'OTAN. Mais ce n'était pas un vrai veto, c'était un veto le cul entre deux chaises, c'est-à-dire on disait, bon, pas tout de suite, mais peut-être demain. Il faut choisir. Et la diplomatie qui ne choisit pas est une mauvaise diplomatie. Ou bien tu dis, oui, l'Ukraine entre tout de suite, Bush l'a demandé, entre tout de suite dans l'OTAN, et à toi, Poutine, qui est là d'ailleurs, parce que Poutine était présent au sommet de Bucarest d'avril 2008, toi, Poutine, je te dis, attention, ne t'avise pas d'attaquer l'Ukraine, parce que maintenant, elle est dans l'OTAN. Ou bien, je dis, euh, l'OTAN n'entrera jamais euh, dans l'OTAN, et c'est clair, et donc, euh, tu, tu dis à Poutine, ne prends pas prétexte euh, de l'extension de l'OTAN pour, euh, faire, euh, pour euh, faire des malheurs euh, à Kiev, puisque nous avons été très clairs, nous avons mis notre veto éternel à l'entrée euh, de l'Ukraine. Et donc, ma conclusion, c'est qu'aujourd'hui, nous avons, hélas, une politique euh, que j'estime, elle va peut-être être changée, j'espère qu'elle va être changée, cette politique. Je pense que Macron a tout à fait raison de vouloir un honest broker, de, vou de vouloir être un faiseur de paix. C'est quelque chose qui est à la portée de la France, à cause de la réputation de la France, à cause de l'histoire de la France. Mais je, je, je trouve qu'il qu 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 s'y prend mal, parce que quand vous, êtes, quand vous ne choisissez pas quand vous, vous restez le cul entre deux chaises, eh bien, en fait, le résultat, c'est que vous mécontentez les uns et les autres. Thank you very much, Renaud. I think um, we may want to come back to you and ask to what extent economic factors may be playing a role, too, in the position of France and its relations with China. I'd like now to turn to Yuichi Hosei. Thank you, Doug. Uh, let me present a Japanese viewpoint on this difficult question. Uh, Japan is the number three economy in the world after the United States and China, but at the same time, I define Japan as a kind of a frontline state. Frontline means that Japan is located at the front line of the confrontation, structural confrontation between the United States and China. That's why Japan's position is quite vulnerable. Japan can benefit from its close relationship with both the United States and China because China is Japan's biggest trading partner while the United States is the only Japan's security alliance partner. But at the same time, if war happens, Japan would be in a really difficult situation because Japan would be vulnerable, not just economically and financially, but militarily as well. That's why Japan needs to respond to this dilemma, difficult question, uh, but Japan doesn't have any clear answer to this question. On the other hand, I think that the Prime Minister Abe presented two strategies to this difficult question. Number one, Abe created the Quad. Quad is a kind of a co collaboration among the four leading democracies in the region, in the Indo-Pacific, United States, Japan, India, and Australia. By collaborating together, the four countries' democracies can respond to the rising China. This is one thing. The other strategy is FOI, free and open Indo-Pacific strategy. With it, Japan presented much more inclusive strategy, fit to connect sub-regions of in the Pacific region. Sub-regions mean Northeast Asia, Southeast Asia, South Asia, Middle East, and also East Africa. Of course, the EU can join in the region, and also the other powers as well, like, of course, China or Russia or any other country can join in the region because Japan's FOIP, free and open in the Pacific strategy is quite inclusive strategy. Why it is inclusive? Because in the beginning, Prime Minister Abe presented quite the strategy, but it seems that Japan is trying to encircle China. If Japan tried to encircle China, the ASEAN cannot join in. If ASEAN cannot join in the regional vision, it means that there is a hole uh, in the middle of the region. That's why it is really necessary for Japan to try to invite ASEAN at the middle of the regional cooperation, I mean the FOIP. But at the same time, uh, ASEAN clearly dislike the idea of dividing 
the block into the two opposing camps. That's why to try to attract, Jap to try to attract ASEAN, it was necessary for Japanese government, particularly under Prime Minister Abe's diplomatic initiative, to try to invite ASEAN into the regional cooperation of free and open in the Pacific. That's why I think that the Prime Minister Abe revised the original regional strategy of the Quad, focusing on the Asian security demo democratic dialogue to try to revise it to present much more inclusive strategy to embrace not just ASEAN, but other countries as well, or regional cooperation as well. So in, the, in this way, I think that Japan has been in a very important position to promote regional cooperation in the area, I mean, the Indo-Pacific region, particularly by presenting two different strategies. On one hand, Japan sti still stick to the Quad strategy, which focus on the importance of norms and ideas of democracy, freedom, rule of law, and human rights, and so on. But at the same time, it is necessary for Japan to present much more inclusive strategy by promoting the free and open Indo-Pacific vision, which can embrace China as well. So in this way, I think that Japan has been in a very important tr position to try to mitigate the tension between two sides. But at the same time, it is also important to note that Japan is sided with the United States in the field of emphasizing on the importance of norms and ideas, because Japan share important norms of democracy, freedom, and the rule of law and human rights with other like-minded partners, particularly the United States. So in this way, I think Japan has been promoting two different strategies, but combining two different strategies, two different strategies, I think that Japan has been in a very important position to promote the regional cooperation in the area. Thank you very much. Uh, I mean, we probably will have a little difference in the view from Korea, please. Thank you, Doc. The intensifying and expanding tension between the U.S. and China is a very serious issue to all of the world but much more serious to Korea because of history and geography. As you know, the China is our immediate neighbor. Mm -hmm. And the military alliance with the United States is a backbone of Korea's foreign policy. But more than 30% uh, of Korea's total export go to China and Hong Kong. And Korea is the largest source of China's import. In addition, the United States and China are two indispensable partners for Korea to manage the threat from North Korea, yeah. maintaining peace and stability in the Korean Peninsula. <laughs> the international political order the Korea want to pursue is non-exclusive. And we highly value cooperation with every country of the world, including China. Therefore, it would be difficult for Korea to join initiative explicitly targeting in China, though, though Korea shares the concerns of the United States of China's economic outreach and its foreign policy. Um, I would like to add one more thing about the Korean companies. Korean companies are global players. And we must note that Korean companies make their investment and business decisions rather independently from the policy of the Korean government. This means even if Korean follows, Korean government follows the US strategic trend as an ally of the United States, Business decision may differ as long as they do not violate relevant laws and regulations. And actually, Korean companies are actively pursuing supply chain diversification, recognizing the importance, more importance of political risk rather than efficiency or cost nowadays. Um, I'd like to add one more thing about 
the Korea's uh, specific concern on the expanding, expanding the China-U.S. conflict. The consequence of China-U.S. conflict leads to the increasing subsidy of the United States, European Union, and Japan. It's a very serious concern to Korea. Uh, those countries are increasing subsidies, especially in the field of you know, the electric vehicle batteries and semiconductors. The reason is to correspond to the state capital of, of China. However, it is distorting international trade order, definitely. So we now currently, WTO dispute settlement mechanism is uh, totally paralyzed, mm -hmm. and we have no means of addressing those distorting international trade practices. So it's a very serious concern. And for Korean companies, in order to respond to increasing subsidies provided by the United States through Inflation Reduction Act and Infrastructure and Jobs Act, they are increasing their investment in the United States. And <coughs> Korean businessmen are fully aware that U.S.-China conflict is a long way to go and is a constant factor for their decision making. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much. So maybe you've had to wait a long time, but I hope you'll be able to jump so in. I, you know, I, I was thinking, should I respond to your question or to what I've heard? Um, if, and both I. You're speak. welcome to do either. So first of all, I, I think our engagement with China is for ourselves. It's we are locked in a uh, Himalayan face-off. We have uh, close to about 100,000 troops, uh, if you count both the armies together, across the line of actual control. Uh, so US does not have to motivate us to face off against China. China does that pretty well by <laughs> itself. Yeah. So it is, it is China that has motivated us to face off, uh, in some sense, against it. But having said that, I think there are two interesting uh, projects, trends, tendencies underway concurrently. The first, of course, is what you mentioned, uh, Chair, in the very beginning, the US perhaps trying to shape the world into two camps, perhaps. I'm not sure that US has a consensus inside it, so I don't think there is a US position uh, that it is trying to preach in any case. I think uh, you may find that the discord within US may become louder mm -hmm. as it tries to pursue that line, if it ever does, so that's the first part. But even if we were to uh, assume that US has some, the deep state has some great idea of carving the world into two camps. I think that's not new for India. We have faced that idea for a very long time and, and successive governments have uh, pursued non-alignment, strategic autonomy, multi-alignment, choose the word you want. But in many ways, we have, it's, it's not a new phenomenon. It's new for Europe, not for us. In fact, now European, Europeans tell us, how did you do that? Can you give us some secret <laughs> recipe? We want to learn from India on how to be able to, okay. uh, to, to manage your own strategic affairs. So American design or European design and making us choose sides is not going to work with us. We don't work in the Manichaean sense, right? For us, we work in grace. We love grace, right? So that's the first project. The second project is the Chinese themselves are trying to distort the character of Asia. So Chinese want a multipolar world, but a unipolar Asia. And that is what we are fighting against. <laughs> so in a sense, we are rejecting the Chinese attempt to create a unipolar Asia. Why would we want a, 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 a hegemonic world where a set of actors dominated? So I don't think India is going to buy into either of the two projects. I think, uh, uh, and, and, and obviously for us, uh, 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 a very good strategic outcome would be that we could partner with France and, and EU and the US in ensuring that China is not able to carve up Asia uh, as it wants at one level, but also to ensure that the world is not forced into certain corners uh, uh, that uh, the big two may want the world to resemble. So I think that's one, uh, one answer. Now let me respond to what I heard. What I heard is that uh, my European colleagues are worried about what Asia 
might do, what Africa might do, what other parts of the world may do. The truth is, it is Europe which is the weak link in this debate. And that is the reality. The, the lure of money, the lure of return, has made Europe incompetent and incapable to take a unified position against China. If you think you're going to see a Russia-styled mobilization against China, we are all living in La La Land. Europe is the weak link for US if it has to mobilize any sort of consortium against China. So please don't do what about me. I heard lots of people talk about Africa, it doesn't want this, Southeast Asia doesn't want this, South Asia, it's Europe that doesn't want it, let's be honest here. And all my European friends have told me they don't want it. They don't want to be in a position when the Germans are told stop selling cars to China, or the French are told stop selling handbags to China. <laughs> Let's be very clear. It's your handbags and your cars that are dictating your, your strategic priorities. Don't blame your own frailties on someone else. So that's the first thing. Uh -huh. I think the question to be asked is that if the Chinese were to invade Taiwan, what would be the European position? And I can tell you that. In fact, I just told you. Uh -huh. Right? Uh, so that's the first part. Uh -huh. The second thing that I heard, which is quite interesting, is about uh, the, 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 in some sense, the the relentlessness of the Chinese project, expansion, economy, and partnerships. And I think that is a very frail assumption to base your future foreign policy on. I would argue that the idea that China would be this um, 100 feet gorilla is exaggerated. I also would argue that the fact that they would continue to enjoy these balance of trade, uh, favorable trading relationships with these countries in the next decade is also to be seen. In fact, I would argue that we may already have seen them peak. Mm -hmm. And now what, we, what emerges post uh, in the coming years may, may uh, see a very different, more vulnerable, and more messy China. And in that sense, uh, maybe this whole idea of mobilizing the world to, to take on this uh, great monster uh, may itself be a futile project. And, 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 and countries... Uh, uh, through niche arrangements, collaborations, partnerships can take them on in different sectors. I think the, the idea that the Chinese are going to uh, dominate the world and therefore we need to start worrying about it itself may be foolhardy in the first instance. I think the Chinese are quite good at uh, uh, destroying their own credibility and, uh, and uh, economy and integrity in the days ahead. You have to, you have to believe in uh, your friends as, uh, as well as your enemies. And I think you should give them a chance to do that. My simple proposition for many of us is that if your neighbors want to hug China, allow them. Allow them to do it. Many of our neighbors did it. And they have realized the cost of that hug. It doesn't end. Geopolitics is not about the moment. It's about decades and centuries. And I think people must make their own decisions, come to their own conclusions. And uh, uh, I, I do believe <coughs> that this is a decade where we will see uh, some, uh, uh, some sort of a rethinking on part of many countries that today we believe are uh, in the red corner. I think th even that is likely to change in the coming days. Uh, but uh, our response to China is because we need to respond to China. We are not going to allow Beijing to shape Asia, uh, uh, put the political map of Asia to suit its purpose. And we will, of course, invite all of you to join us in that uh, endeavor to prevent them from doing that. But don't, uh, don't expect us to, believe in the, uh, to, to stand in the corner of Uncle Sam. We are, happy doing, we are happy taking on the dragon by ourselves. And of course, we seek partnerships as well. Well, thank you very much for addressing the heart of the question. And now we, we turn to our, our good friend in Beijing, uh, Wang Jisi. Uh, thank you very much, Doc. Could you hear me? Yes, yeah. very well. Okay. Uh, I apologize for not being able to take the conference in person uh, because of the COVID regulations in Beijing. Uh, I actually, I just returned to Beijing from Berlin, and I talked to a number of German officials and scholars there, so I could even... Pr pr <clears throat> Uh, provide a German perspective on this picture. Uh, the Europeans continue to be strongly interested in trading with and investing in China. Uh, uh, Chancellor Schulz went to Beijing last month and Charles Monsieur 
the European Council president was in Beijing in early December. They will be followed probably by President Macron of France. So Beijing is very happy with all these visits. But in Berlin, some business leaders told me that their commercial interests in China have met with public opinion polls and media reports in Germany that are increasingly negative about China. And Chancellor Schultz uh, to him was somewhat controversial uh, because of part of because of in Germany. Uh, he belongs to one party and the foreign minister and his other candidates belong to another, the Green Party. So there have some uh, uh, problems there. And I also heard in Germany uh, the draft of Germany's first China strategy report was leaked to the press last month. Mm -hmm. And the German foreign ministry and the political pressure from home has to modify it to appear somewhat more hawkish toward China. I hope that is not the case, but I'm not sure. Some officials said to me that Germany will increase its military budget, be closer to the United States in geopolitical terms, and try to strengthen NATO. And Europeans and Americans hold similar views on China in ideological terms, being critical of China's human rights and some other domestic policies. So on the one hand, Europe will keep its strategic autonomy, especially in the economic and the technological dimensions in dealing with China. Climate change is another dimension for China and Europe to work together. On the other hand, the EU and Britain will lean to the US as far as geopolitics and ideology are concerned. I want to mention the recent visit by Xi Jinping to Saudi Arabia. I think it is not simply a bilateral visit. Xi Jinping joined Arab leaders in the first China-Arab States Summit and China GCC Summit. So I think China has more ambitions uh, than simply bilateral relations with Arab countries. It is trying to establish a one to multiple platform with Arab countries and uh, the countries in the region as a whole. And the Chinese say that we are more open, we are more inclusive. Uh, they are comparing uh, their uh, scheme with American, uh, some American projects. For instance, Americans have uh, I2, U2 mechanism, that is India, uh, Israel, uh, United States and UAE. China says that we should be more inclusive. Our platform can include the United States, the European countries, Russia, India, everybody. And we are open uh, to include them in uh, Shanghai Cooperation Organization or BRICS. Uh, so probably we'll see a more proactive Chinese approach to the Middle East and to the third world countries at large. Now a few things about Taiwan. I agree some other, with some others that a massive military action or a full-scale military takeover of Taiwan is not likely in any foreseeable future. The reference to Taiwan in the 20th Party Congress is milder than most observers expected. They are, uh, the, the report com, com, uh, continues to emphasize peaceful unification and the one country, two system, despite the uproars we often hear from some more militant, uh, uh, militant and belligerent uh, vo uh, nationalistic voices in social media. And my, I think China's top priorities at this moment are not Taiwan. They are two, twofold. First, uh, Omicron or COVID. Beijing's COVID policy changed dramatically since last week. And people in Beijing, like myself, 
are perplexed to see confusing and conflicting regulations and signals announced by the government. Infection cases are surging alarmingly in my neighborhood and in the whole city of Beijing. Unless and until we successfully deal with this problem, we are not ready to focus on Taiwan. It's hard to imagine that the PLA soldiers landing on Taiwan have to wear masks. <laughs> Second, the economy. The economic growth is low, record low this year, and unemployment is terribly high. I don't uh, want to uh, explain that because there are more, many media reports on, on China's economy. This is why I think Taiwan is not high on Beijing's political agenda. Uh, and recently, Xi Jinping met with Biden uh, in Bali, Indonesia, and their summit went quite well, and they, uh, they achieved the, uh, the agreement that they don't want to fight each other, with each other. And Biden went back saying that he doesn't see uh, the immediate uh, conflict over Taiwan. That is a good sign. However, we in China have to worry about two things on Taiwan. First, U.S. approach to Taiwan is moving from assuring Beijing that Washington will stick to its one China policy to, to assuring Taipei that it will be given more assistance to the island's uh, defense. Uh, we are see increased danger that one day Washington would give up this one China policy and instead recognize an independent Taiwan. I'm not thinking this as a, a, a reality, but there are fears in China this way. Nancy Pelosi's visit to t Taiwan triggered a major military crisis and political crisis. Kevin McCarthy, the perspective a prospective House Speaker in the United States announced he would lead a large congressional delegation to Taiwan early in 2023. If that happened, Beijing would have to would have no choice but to respond with more decisive military moves, which could result in an uncontrollable confrontation. The second hidden danger is Taiwan's internal politics. The opposition party, KM, K the KMT, won more seats in the last election. But even the KMT would not support, Taiwan, uh, Ta support unification with the mainland. I hope Doug Paul will say more about Taiwan's <laughs> internal politics because he knows a great deal. Uh, that is what I'm going to say. Thank you. Thank you very much, Jesus. Uh, you've given us a, a very concise uh, tour of the horizon on Chinese policy toward uh, Europe, Taiwan, and uh, foreign policy generally and domestic politics. Um, I want to turn to my panel now and ask you, um, starting with the observation that I have, which is the invasion of Ukraine by uh, Russia precipitated quite unexpectedly a cascade of commentary in the U.S. about how Ukraine and Taiwan have a lot in common. And China will take the lesson from what Putin did. This was mostly in the early months of 2022 after the invasion. Um, there seemed to be a direct relationship between prediction of a coming invasion of Taiwan by China to the lack of knowledge of the person writing the commentary. We have a lot of non-experts offering so-called expert opinion on this. Um, you're all experts on your own countries and attitudes. What do you think are the prospects for this kind of conflict over Taiwan? Jisa has just reminded us that there, the U.S. is going through change with the return of the Republicans in Congress. Uh, we have an election yeah. coming up. Taiwan has a presidential election coming in January 2024, which invites all sorts of new political games to go on in Taiwan. China has just sort of stabilized after the 20th Party Congress. So the action is more likely to be outside China than in, in terms of 
changing the relationship among the three parties. Um, from your individual perspectives, how do you see the situation with respect to Taiwan? Well, don't you think that there are, there are experts and experts, and not all policies are made by the right experts? Yeah. Um, I mean, I don't think, if you've gone back, um, way back beyond before February the 24th, few people would have thought of the invasion, even of the Russian invasion of Ukraine, even though uh, there had been the battle, the, the war in Georgia in 2008, lasted all of five days. I mean, we've got used to the idea that states do not get war against other states. They, they fight against non-state actors. So that's one thing. Uh, secondly, I think that um, Donald Trump, now I wouldn't call Donald Trump an expert on anything, yeah. but he really did change the whole, perhaps advised by people like Peter Navarro, um, picture vis-a-vis -vis China and the, and the USA. And the, the measures that Trump brought in, basically a trade war, um, they're there, and Biden hasn't taken away most of them, and now you have the chip choke. So I think, with all due respect to Samir, I mean, yes, everybody wants to avoid things going wrong, but they can go wrong. And one of the problems of, I mean, you know, Biden likes to think of this as democracies against authoritarian states, which I think is a very simplistic way of looking at it. Uh, but the problem with democracies is that they have very short-term horizons. The, the experts may not, but the politicians do. Mm -hmm. And I worry that uh, things, you know, you get a sort of inexorable slide towards something which is worse than you'd want. Um, we'd, nobody in their right minds really would want to have a cold war between the US and China. But it's not exactly a warm feeling at the moment, and it's hard to see how the warmth will return. That, I think, is the real problem. And there's no real analogy with the old Cold War. Um, you had the non-aligned movement, but in fact, the non-aligned movement really had to sort of uh, choose sides in the end. I don't think that's going to happen this time because history is not going to repeat itself. But nonetheless, I don't think we're in a happy place. And if, I mean, God forbid, Donald Trump were to become president again, um, all bets are off. Plus, just a last thing. Um, we really do not, I think, understand Xi Jinping. We don't have a real picture of him. If you are in East Asia or in India and, and South Asia, yes, you have this security architecture. You've got alliances between the US and um, individual countries, and you've got the Quad and so on, which I think was an excellent idea. Um, so it's better to talk, but I don't think, we, I think it was Lee Kuan Yew who once said when, you know, elephants, uh, fight, the grass gets trampled, and when they make love, the grass gets trampled as well. So uh, we're not really in a terribly happy position. Anyone else want to jump yeah. in? Okay, well, I think there are many differences between uh, Taiwan and Ukraine. The first one we have to keep in mind is Taiwan is an island. There is no, no territorial continuity between men and China and Taiwan. So uh, to con take control of an island, even with the very modern and sophisticated military, it's a, it's a, it's a very complicated task. Um, I don't think that the PLA today is ready to launch uh, you know, a landing operation uh, against Taiwan. It can uh, launch missile strikes. It can maybe impose a blockade, but the problem with the blockade is uh, how long you can hold it. And uh, the big difference between uh, Ukraine and Taiwan is I don't think that uh, the U.S. can conduct a proxy war in Taiwan. Uh, it's, uh, it's very likely, it's highly likely that the U.S. will be involved in a war in Taiwan with those risks attached to the fact that you have two nuclear power uh, involved in a, in, in a direct confrontation. So um, I think that will continue to sort of uh, compel China to think twice before launching an attack against Taiwan. What I see, and I agree with this, uh, on, this uh, on that, is that it's more likely that China will continue to, it's what it has been called, it's a gray zone strategy of coercion against Taiwan, mm -hmm. than to uh, 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 start a full-fledged invasion of Taiwan. Now, the problem with the f uh, gray zone strategy is that uh, it, it, it's not without risks. And what I'm worried about, of course, is that, uh, as I think uh, it was alluded to by T. is the fact that the uh, gray zone strategy can get out of control. 
Um, imagine if uh, the uh, PLA uh, Air Force enters Taiwan's uh, airspace. Uh, the, uh, the Taiwanese uh, fighter will have to scramble and to to to, to um, you know force these uh, fighters to move out of the airspace in one way or another. So um, there are risks of, uh, of incidents and even of military crisis. The big question is how we both. I mean, the U.S. and uh, well, Taiwan and China, first of all, will be able to manage that crisis. There is no channel of communication now between men China and Taiwan. I mean, the, the yeah. because China yeah. has refused to talk to the Ta Taiwan, and that's that's a real issue. Um, you know, on Taiwan, there is a, a growing, uh, uh, you know, in Taiwanese identity, which doesn't mean that everyone is favor independence. But I think the idea is that. Uh, um, Taiwan is not the PRC. It's a, it's another entity which has an official name, which is the Republic of China, and even if it's not recognized as a nation state, it's a de facto state. So we had we, we I mean we have to admit the reality that there are actually even if there is one China, there are two states or two governments which should be you know should interact on an equal footing. And even if the KMT comes back to power in Taiwan, I don't think that uh, the issue will be solved because everyone in Taiwan is against the idea that Taiwan becomes a special industry region of the PRC. Uh, Taiwan has never been part of the PRC, so it will... I mean, both sides will have to negotiate another deal. And here, I think uh, it, will, it will be much more pro productive of the part of China to sort of uh, open the channel of communication with the, Ch with the Chinese authorities, whoever sits in the presidential palace in Taipei. And here, uh, we're far from it. So if there is a role of uh, uh, honest broker that the US could play, is to sort of convince China to uh, talk to uh, the authorities in Taiwan, whoever they are. Well, uh, it was uh, Renaud who, who mentioned the Thucydides trap. <laughs> and I mean, Graham Allison, of course, says it's not inevitable, but it's likely, yep. uh, which I th think is rather worrying. Yes, but the nuclear, I mean, the fact that we are having two nuclear powers, I think it's a disincentive for... It should uh, sober people up. But uh, we don't know, because yeah. uh, that was true under the, uh, at the time of the old Cold War, yeah. whether it's going to remain true in the new Cold War, or, or the fact, uh, it's, it's another story. I mean, the, and that's from, from, from your two responses, I, I get that you, th let's say, You'd say 60% unlikely there'll be an attack on Taiwan, but there's enough unusual circumstances and potential conflict opportunities that it might be 40% lead us into an undesired conflict. Uh, others have a reaction to that? I don't think at all that there will be an attack, like our Chinese colleague said, in the Chinese future, close to Taiwan for several reasons. The first c'est que ça ne correspond pas à la stratégie chinoise. La stratégie chinoise, c'est de gagner euh, la guerre sans bataille. Euh, et donc, d'arriver à un moment où la flotte chinoise ce sera, sera si considérable euh, que euh, les Taïwanais eux-mêmes diront « Bon, OK, on va aller euh, baiser la babouche » à Pékin et euh, les Chinois de Pékin y répondront, eh bien, mes chers amis, mais bien sûr, vous pouvez garder votre autonomie et vous gérer euh, euh, vous-même. Je pense que c'est ça la stratégie chinoise. Il y a eu... Euh, les Chinois euh, sont des commerçants, ce ne sont pas des guerriers. Alors, euh, et lorsqu'ils ont voulu jouer aux guerriers, euh, ça s'est très mal passé, c'était contre le Vietnam en 1900. Euh, 79, quand ils ont voulu donner une leçon, c'est plutôt le Vietnam qui a donné une leçon à la Chine. Donc je pense que euh, ce n'est pas leur idée, que d'ailleurs, euh, ce sont des commerçants et donc ils veulent protéger leur commerce. Et ils savent très bien que s'ils attaquent euh, Taïwan, il y aura euh, des répercussions, euh, des sanctions considérables. Et ils les évitent. Et j'ai remarqué que euh, les grandes sociétés chinoises, et on peut me contredire ici, mais les grandes sociétés chinoises qui ont très peur des sanctions de Washington et de Bruxelles, respectent les sanctions, je parle des grandes sociétés, qui ont été euh, décidées contre la Russie euh, sur la guerre euh, en Ukraine. Alors évidemment, euh, une attaque de Ta Taïwan serait possible. Elle serait possible quand Eh bien, lorsque euh, les Américains auraient la tête ailleurs. Euh, on a déjà eu ce phénomène. On a déjà eu la Turquie qui a pris euh, 40% de l'île de Chypre 
en, en l'été 1974, pourquoi est-ce que la Turquie a pu prendre comme ça 38% de l'île de Chypre bien Parce que euh, le pouvoir à Washington était complètement paralysé à, à le, ce jour-là par l'affaire du Watergate. Donc je pense que si les Chinois euh, attaquaient euh, Taïwan, ils le feraient par exemple pendant une élection américaine ou une élection contestée ou quelque chose comme ça. Mais, euh, mais je ne je, je, sais pas leur... Aujourd'hui, ça ne me semble pas être leur politique, leur politique première, me semble, mais je peux me tromper, me semble être de, avant tout, protéger leur commerce. Thank you for introducing those factors right now. Um, listening to Gisa and all of the conversations and thinking about, you know, you say we don't know Xi Jinping after 10 years in office. Well, if we don't know him after 10 years, I'm worried because we, yeah. we ought to know something about the man by now. It strikes but me... But I don't think he's had any single interview with oh, he won't. a length he won't. interview. Exactly. No, that's not going to happen. Um, but I, I, was, I would propose that this is a good, a good time if China wants to, to, to change its tactics. The, uh, we, we're seeing in various subtle ways China pulling back on its aggressiveness in the South China Sea, the Sen Senkaku Islands and others. They're not changing fundamental positions, but they're being less aggressive. Mm. Maybe that will be true on the Indian line of actual control as well. I don't know at this point. But it would be, for me, it would be a great time for China to show some tactical flexibility. If Kevin McCarthy shows up in Taipei with a delegation, China says, what, another <laughs> speaker of the house shows up? Who cares? Yeah. We're not going to have an act. Secondly, China can quietly begin to recommence communication with Taiwan's authorities send some faxes with their former contacts who were in regular contact with the mainland before Tsai Ing-wen got elected as president. China could lower the temperature a lot during this crisis uh, or to, to head off a crisis uh, in the time ahead if it wants to think creatively. Yeah, I mean, do you have a point? I want to turn some to the audience in a couple minutes, so please be yeah. brief. I think, uh, you see, uh, this year, U.S. has made uh, two very important declarations regarding China. One is uh, made by Janet Yellen, U.S. Trade Secretary, in April, that U.S. will pursue free but secure trade with French shoring. It's a very significant declaration. That means the U.S. will not address China issues within the context of WTO. A second the important declaration was made by, in October by U.S. National Security Strategy, which designated China as the only competitor which both have intent and capability to reshape international order. Mm. It was preceded by sweeping ban on sales of advanced chips to China a week earlier. You know, the, uh, Thomas Friedman of New York Times described that it is the facto declaration of war of the United States against China. But I would like to draw your attention that U.S. rhetoric is very strong. However, with regard to IPF, the core strategy of U.S. Indo-Strategic Indo-Pacific Indo strategy, Indo-Pacific economic framework, U.S. has not invited Taiwan. IPF is de facto FTA negotiations minus market access. <laughs> However, it's a FTA which is totally legal under the WTO, even if U.S. invited Taiwan, because Since the FTA is negotiated under the framework WTO, WTO membership is not for sovereign states, it's for customs territory. So it is totally legal for U.S. to include Taiwan in IPF, but they do not. They instead pursue bilateral trade and investment agreement with Taiwan, which I think U.S is mindful of the lead line with regard to Taiwan by China. U.S. strong rhetoric against possibility of China's aggression to Taiwan is to deter China's aggression into Taiwan. 
I may suspect. Thank you. Samir. Two short points, and I think we can go to the audience. The first, I am really worried when very wise people around the world somehow assume that she is a very rational and sane actor. And there are no data points to prove that. Nothing that he has done since he has taken charge would lend you to believe that you're dealing with someone who is rational and, and uh, mature. And yet we are uh, painting him in uh, the colors of great wisdom. Well, he did have wolf warrior diplomacy. Uh, yeah, so that is quite wise, right? Yeah. Uh, so uh, if, if that is the data point that makes you believe that he is a wise actor, uh, I'm worried. Now, that's one part of it. So I think let's, be a, let's not be premature in our assessment that uh, we are dealing with someone who's, 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 who's wise and sage and will bide his time. He's not interested in biding his time anymore. I think that is the only single message that is coming out of Xi's China. No need to hide. No need to bide. It is time to stake claim, and it's time to reshape the politics of the world. I think that is the single message. If you're not hearing it, then I want you to come to some conferences we host in Delhi and start hearing that. Because I think some of us don't get the message. That's number one. Number two, uh, and this is important. I think forget about Taiwan. The question should be, what do you do when China decides to change the territory, territorial map of any country in the world? I think that's the question you should ask. They gave you a fate, a compliance, South China Sea, what did you do? They disregarded the tribunal verdict, what did you do? They decided to change the map of the Himalayas, what did you do? You told us, trade more with China, have a dialogue. If I was Taiwan, I should be very worried. None of your behavior should give any sort of confidence to Taiwan that there is going to be any sort of response from any quarter. You will tell Taiwan, we will have a new trade deal with you, join them. I suspect that is going to be the voice coming out of Europe. Because that is what we heard. Now, I'm not even going further west. Ask the Afga Afghanistan folks what they think about believing in, any folk, a, 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 in, in anyone who believed that they were going to create order and value-based foreign policies. You threw them under the truck. <laughs> in prime time, you know, prime time television. Who is in that part of the world going to rely on any sort of... Uh, anyway, sorry. Well, thank you for those two interjections. Now, we are ready to take uh, questions from the audience. I hope the microphones are ready. Uh, we have questions here in the front row. This is hand is out for a while, then we'll first here and then there. Thank you. Um, yeah, my name is Zaki Laiti. I'm a special advisor to the higher representative of the European Union. Uh, I, I do believe that it's quite naive to think uh, that China will never use force. Uh, because they are uh, from a merchant uh, uh, tradition. Apart from that, I wanted to hear from our Asian um, colleagues their uh, reading on the 7 October uh, decision taken by uh, the United States, which we regard in Europe as an extremely, extremely, extremely important declaration. Yeah. with huge implications. Yeah. First, because the impact is wide. Fundamentally, the United States is trying to replicate the Hawaii Way model to the whole semiconductor industry. It had been done largely on a unilateral basis. And the, the point in common that we have with the Chinese with the, the Japanese, sorry, is that one of the firm is like our uh, Dutch firm, ASML, uh, largely concerned by the uh, decision. So uh, I didn't read um, precise assessment on this. So I would be really uh, happy to hear about the assessment you made, I mean, in all three countries, on this decision, which in my view uh, is one of the most fundamental decision taken by the administration on the line of the Trump administration. Thank you. Thank you for that question um, about the Tom Friedman's declaration of war. We have a question here and then one across the room. And uh, we, 
euh, de, euh, une question. Curieusement, on n'a pas parlé de Hong Kong. Est-ce que la cause de Hong Kong est totalement oubliée Est-ce que la messe est complètement dite Ça, c'est ma première question pour Jean-Pierre Cavestan. La deuxième est peut-être plus une remarque, peut-être pour notre ami chinois. Euh, la Chine est confrontée à un recul euh, économique majeur. Parce que je prends l'hypothèse que 4% de croissance en Chine, c'est l'équivalent de la croissance zéro pour nous à peu près. Est-ce qu'il n'y a pas quand même un risque que, face à cet presque échec économique, il n'y ait une montée en puissance d'un discours nationaliste Et comme l'a dit notre ami indien, il n'est pas du tout sûr que Xi Jinping soit aussi rationnel que nous ne le pensons. One more question. Across here, to the end of the row. Alors, sans remettre en cause la justesse du, euh, du sujet, en l'occurrence la rivalité euh, sino-américaine, vous me permettrez de, de me poser en votre présence des, des questions. Euh, en fait, le sujet essentiel est aussi les nouveaux mondes qui viennent. Réduire l'intégralité de la dynamique des changements actuels à la seule rivalité sino-américaine, est à mon sens euh, d'abord frustrante pour tout le reste. Cela veut dire que dans l'inconscient des gens qui l'abordent, le monde qui vient va être toujours un monde de rivalité et de domination. Donc très sympathique pour l'intégralité des autres pays. Mais au-delà de cette euh, problématique, quand on s'intéresse de très près aux grands acteurs, d'abord l'acteur américain, il emporte avec lui son monde, sa vision, sa philosophie, son espace financier, il a évolué, il se pose des questions, il essaye de rebâtir d'autres alliances, il projette. Donc c'est déjà un monde. C'est un système monde, euh, le G7. En face, les Chinois sont loin d'être inintelligents. Eux-mêmes ne réduisent pas leur évolution à la seule rivalité sino-américaine. Eux se posent la question si face à un système monde, ils peuvent à eux tout seuls prétendre le remettre en question et que font-ils Ils essayent de structurer un nouveau monde quand on s'intéresse à la roue de la soie, la réduire à une seule dimension commerciale, c'est méconnaître totalement la pensée politique des uns et des autres. Ils savent, et ils ne sont pas les seuls, que face à un monde, essayer de triompher ou de faire basculer, il faut un autre monde. D'où d'ailleurs les instruments des uns et des autres qui s'appellent embargo, qui s'appellent contenir. Qui ça. Et à mon sens, s'intéresser au monde qui vient, aux stratégies développées par les uns et les autres pour mieux comprendre les évolutions qui viennent et quelles sont les stratégies des acteurs serait certainement plus opportun. Je vous remercie. Well, we have um, three questions which... Uh... The October 7 decision, which is very Trumpist-like from the Biden administration to constrain China's future high-tech high uh, growth. Is China getting weaker, or is China going to dictate the order, world order? Last weekend, there was a conference in Washington where the Secretary of State Blinken spoke, and he said that China is now so strong, we have to worry they're going to try to take over Taiwan. And a few hours later, his deputy spoke and said, China is so weak now, we have to worry they may want to come and uh, take over Taiwan. <laughs> <laughs> so that's, we've got full circularity in our thinking about how to deal with it. Our questions give uh, the panel a chance to, to respond. Do any of you want to speak? And, and GC, uh, there was a dir question directed to you as well. We'd like to go first. Oh, well, uh, yes, but I don't speak, I uh, don't understand French. Oh, so and uh, so I didn't get the uh, questions to me. Anyway, I would intervene by saying, first of all, there's a great deal of concern in China uh, when you compare Ukraine with Taiwan. Uh, to all the Chinese, Taiwan is part of China. Uh, Ukraine is a sovereign state. So whatever we do to Taiwan is our domestic affairs. 
whatever we do is uh, legal and uh, legitimate. Uh, so that's why uh, we don't take Taiwan and uh, Ukraine together. This, of course, is the official position and also the public sentiment. That makes some sense. The, the problem is, uh, of course, most people in, people in most countries in the United States recognize one China and Taiwan is part of China. There is a great distinction between U.S. position and U.S. Chinese position on this issue. That is, the United States says it has a one China policy and we say we have a one China principle. The difference is whether Taiwan is part of China. The U.S. one China policy says the United States only recognize the PRC as the representative of China and uh, there's only one China. But what is Taiwan? It doesn't say. It, it is it's some, sometimes very ambiguous about this. But uh, another problem we have to worry about is that there is a very strong military commitment made by the United States in defending Taiwan. And the United States does, does not and did not make such a an commitment to Ukraine. That is uh, also a, a very uh, meaningful difference. Thank you, Jisa. I think you also touched in your earlier remarks on the difficulties of overcoming COVID, Omicron challenges inside China, and the uh, challenges to the Chinese economy's growth in the current period, which I think partly addresses the question that was addressed to you. Now to the October 7 and other issues, please, panel. Given. May I? Yes. Uh, well, relating to uh, realignment of supply chain in the region, I think that the many Japanese business companies are now thinking about several important factors. Number one, Chinese population is shrinking, while the United States and India population are expanding. This is a new trend. The other thing is that the politics in, domestic politics in China becomes much more unpredictable than before. This is number two. Number three is that there are some geoeconomic risks in the United States, not in, just in China. It means that as long as the United States government or the Congress in, in, is introducing more legal actions to try to decouple the area. I mean, that, that's why Japanese business companies need to consider these new risks to export goods to the United States. Because of this, I think that the Japanese business companies, more and more Japanese business companies are now diversifying the direction of Japanese investments in other countries, particularly in Indonesia and India, together with other countries. So this is a new trend, e even though China remains really important Japanese trading partner. But with a, well, uh, relatively speaking, I think that the Japanese business company are now diversifying its trading strategy unlike before, considering American reaction to American decoupling policy, which introduced more legal actions to try to decouple the two economic blocks. So can, can yes, I sir. just very quickly respond to your question? I think it's an important question that you asked. Um, if you were to remove Xi Jinping era and go back, say, 10 years, you would find much of India's anxiety centered around American control of critical sectors that could be inimical to our growth in the future. And, and it's a fact, you, you, if, whether it's the control of the ICANN, whether it's control of uh, some of the key electronic and energy supplies, that was true. Today, because of the behavior of Xi Jinping, uh, there might be a tendency for some to see this as a good political uh, choice to make and perhaps uh, see the US as the lesser of the problem vis-a-vis uh, 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 what China offers today, but for a country of our size, where, uh, you know, where I'm sitting, I think uh, we will have to diversify and we will have to build some of our own capabilities alongside. So I think for us, uh, having anyone control the single most important vital ingredient for our economic growth and having only one source uh, 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 as, as an option is, is not very comfortable. Like I said, go back 10 years and Indian anxiety would be about Western control of key uh, inputs uh, come come in you know Xi Jinping comes in and suddenly we start seeing uh, the world in a different way but uh, on a longer term uh, I agree with the Japanese colleague diversification 
investments into multiple different geographies and building certain critical capabilities for countries that have size and scale is, is vital. So I think uh, yes, uh, Korean companies are very mindful of the U.S. sanctions, and especially the, the October 7th is a sweeping ban on advanced chip sales to China. Definitely, Korea will abide by U.S. sanctions and relevant uh, laws and regulations. However, in view of the fact that China is the largest market of the world, Korean companies will not give it up. Therefore, Korean companies from now on will be in China, but only just for China. They will not use China as a hub for exporting to certain yeah, certain countries. Okay. Well, thank you for that. Um, ladies and gentlemen, we've reached the end of our time, and we are the last. Uh, uh, Jean-Pierre, on, on Hong Kong, which I thought was a very you on Hong Kong? Oh, very, very, yeah, very, very quickly, very, please. Briefly, uh, I would say from a political point of view, it's game over. I don't think there is any meaningful political life in Hong Kong anymore. So uh, I think it's uh, the Communist Party and its uh, local representatives, the so-called uh, Hong Kong patriots, uh, who are running the place. Now, it doesn't mean that Hong Kong is totally aligned to China in terms of public freedoms. We still have a free access to internet. We, I think we still enjoy more academic freedom than in mainland China, uh, but, but, but uh, it's part of China and, and it's, uh, I think um, and the Communist Party is very, really much in a, in a, in a, in a driving seat. Uh, in Hong Kong now. So. Well, well, thank you. And thank you, audience, for staying with us. Please join me in thanking our panel for their uh, observations. <laughs> <laughs>